Hi there, everybody, and we're going to get started now. Um, so if you've been following along with the webinar series, we've been mostly highlighting um, Raven um, until the last time around we had given a bit of an introduction to um, some of our other software packages, Convergence Compra was one of them. And so today's focus is actually going to be on that uh, composite process modeling using Compro, um, and particularly focusing on process-induced deformations. That's really springing in, in what a lot of people would refer to. So the format's going to be very similar um, for that we've followed on the, the other webinars. Um, we'll do a little bit of an introduction here. I'll introduce uh, our presenter today um, and talk just a bit generically about convergent. Um, and then we'll actually get into the details of the, the technical portion here um, with the, what are process-induced deformations, what are the driving causes, and then how do we assess these using Compro um, with a bit of an example. There's always going to be an opportunity for um, some question and answer. Um, so at any point during the, the sessions, please um, chat with the host, um, and then we'll have about a, a 10 minute uh, window for a question and answer at the end here. So just to talk about the presenters today, so I'm Alice McKee here. I'm the engineering lead for analysis applications group. Um, I'm the host. Um, and Paulo Silva is uh, one of our uh, applications engineers here at Convergent. Um, he's got a master's in aerospace engineering. Um, previously, had worked with some of our um, uh, affiliated um, academic institutions here, Constitutes Research Network at UBC. Um, it's been with it Convergent for uh, about three years now and uh, does many of our advanced simulations as well. So he's going to talk about one of the, the more um, today simulations with our process and deformations um, and go through the details. And so this is our, our little quick advertisement for Convergent. Um, essentially what we focus on is reducing risk um, and cost in, um, in complex processing. Uh, and so we focus on a lot of different tools. We have anything from software packages um, to the, the testing to, to feed those packages, as well as hardware and, and, um, and tools for um, processing aids, like our coho vacuum leak detection system. Um, today we're going to focus on one of the flagship softwares, which is Compro, uh, and we'll go through a few different examples of how it can be used here uh, to help reduce risk. I'm going to pass it over now to, Sil uh, to Paolo Silva um, to actually talk through the actual the details here. Hi. Uh, thanks, Alistair. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Um, so let's um, get into the meat of the, this webinar. So today we're talking about uh, process-induced deformation um, and assessment of them using Compro. Um, so we have to start by defining what the what the problem is, what what's the issue, and in general, uh, when we're talking about composites, um, one of the main issues um, in manufacturing is that uh, the final shape of your composite component uh, is going to be different from from the shape of the tool that you use to to manufacture that component. So the question is raised straight away um, of uh, dimensional conformance, which is basically um, how well does our manufacturer component dimensionally agrees with the engineering specification? So we have to we have to take into consideration now that uh, whatever uh, we design for our component um, is going to is going to be different than than what comes out of the tool if that tool shape uh, was exactly the same as as that engineering specification. Um, so if we have uh, out of tolerance part dimension um, resulting from the manufacturing, this can cause a lot of different problems in our in our process. So number one is we have problems with fitting and, and assembly. So if we have uh, if we just manufacture a wing skin, for example, and we want to assemble it to the rest of your wing structure, um, now all of a sudden, if 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 it's out of spec with the tolerances, then you might not be able to do it. Um, also, you can have damage in cracking if, if you actually try to fit it, if you have to deform the part now to fit to the rest of your assembly, um, or if you have um, 
parts that have, have critical shapes, such as uh, aerodynamic surfaces uh, on an aircraft, or if you have, if you're building an antenna dish, um, all of a sudden uh, your part gets gets rejected straight out of the autoclave. Um, and then, if you want to uh, compensate for and, and fix these uh, dimensional conformance problems, uh, it can be very expensive to do it through um, trial and error troubleshooting. So you have uh, the cost of the tool, which can, can go up to the millions. Uh, you have the cost of the part. Um, you have to spend time reworking the tool, and, and um, for each iteration of your, of your troubleshooting process, this takes, can take quite a lot of time. And then also you have to take into account uh, the time that it takes to manufacture each, each part that you're, that you're uh, manufacturing. Um, so this might not be um, a big problem uh, if, you're, if you're building uh, simple components. Uh, so there's a, a certain acceptable level of manufacturing risk. Um, but as you move uh, from uh, simple panels and rods all the way up to wing structures and fuselage sections, um, if you don't have um, risk assessment strategies, um, if you don't mitigate uh, the troubles of, of process-induced deformations, then you'll quickly go over this manufacturing risk and, and have a situation that's unmanageable. Um, so in order to uh, bring this manufacturing risk to an acceptable level all the way up to uh, fully assembled structures, um, process simulation provides an effective tool to, to help reduce this risk and have, have it be evenly distributed and, and, and manageable throughout your entire manufacturing. Um, so in our approach um, to process simulation, we, we uh, do things physics-based, uh, which basically means that it's, our modeling is grounded on the understanding of the causality of the events. Um, so this basically means that for everything that happens during the manufacturing process, we have a mathematical representation that's capable of describing the, the physical process that's happening. Um, so in this case, for um, uh, manufacturing of a composite uh, component, uh, there's three essential um, um, big areas that we need to take into consideration. So the first one is obviously the material that's being processed, so we have to know um, what's the incoming state of the material, and we also need to know um, how is the material going to evolve throughout the, the manufacturing process. Um, also, the process itself, we have to, we have to know um, what's the sequence of events, what's the sequence of changing boundary conditions in your problem. So in this case, how the temperature, how the pressure, um, how does the different parts um, interact during the um, during the manufacturing process and also the equipment. So this is the, the part of the interaction um, between the different, the different components. And all these three areas, um, they, they influence each other. For example, um, if you, depending on the material that is select for your tool, you're going to have uh, different heating rates um, of your part based on basically the thermal mass of your tool. So if you choose something that's very thick, made out of invar, um, it's going to uh, heat up a lot slower than if you choose, for example, a composite, a composite tool. Um, and then moving forward to um, describing what are the root causes of process-induced deformations um, based on, on the physical, a physics-based assessment of, of the causes. Um, so, uh, number one, we have um, the anisotropic um, thermal expansion and cure shrinkage um, phenomena of the composite. So, because we have um, different materials, we have resins, we have fibers, we can have um, different types of layers in, in a laminate. Uh, we have anisotropic behavior in terms of, of, of shrinkage of the material um, in terms of its in-plane behavior versus its through thickness, which will cause, um, especially in curved laminates, it will cause spring in during, um, at the end of the manufacturing process. Um, layup imbalances are also another cause of, of uh, process-induced deformations. So in this case, if we have 
Um, for example, a laminate that's very heavy on zero degree plies at, at the bottom versus uh, 90 degree plies at the, um, uh, at the top. This will create uh, different um, uh, thermal expansion uh, coefficients between the two two sides of the laminate, which will which will cause the laminate to bend on itself and cause warpage. Um, another big um, factor is the interaction between the tool and the part, um, and this mainly happens through um, thermal expansion and contraction. So as um, you heat up the the autoclave, uh, your tool and your part will expand at um, um, differently, so this will uh, induce stresses at the interface, and then the same thing will happen when, when you're cooling off um, at the end of the process. Um, and then especially if you have uh, big parts uh, or, or very thick parts or different uh, varying sections, um, you can have thermal gradients in your part, so this will, this will generally lead to different parts, um, different sections of your part to be cured at different rates. Um, so they will, they will shrink at different rates, residual stress will develop differently in the part, and this could also ultimately lead to uh, part distortions. And then finally, you can, um, even before putting the part in the autoclave, you can, you can have a starting point uh, of a, a tool that doesn't, um, doesn't conform to, to spec in terms of dimensions. Um, so, what all these um, um, factors have in common, all these scores have in common, is that they they will induce residual stress in your component, and that's what will what will make your your part um, distort and deform at the end of the manufacturing process. So we have to have um, a good um, materials-based, physics-based understanding of of what. What are the causes of this residual stress development? Um, and in this case, uh, what is key is that um, we know the evolution of the material properties um, during the entire time of, of manufacturing. Um, so, in and and it's especially important for the for the matrix uh, because that's the usually the one the one material of your composite that's that's evolving during manufacturing um, cycle. The fiber is, is relatively constant in that regard. Um, so in order to um, have a good representation of, of residual stress development, we need to know exactly how uh, the elastic or viscoelastic properties of the resin are going to evolve. Uh, and this means having a representation of the elasticity modulus or in the Poisson's ratio, or alternatively, we can have uh, bulk and shear moduli representations. Uh, we also need to know what's the thermal expansion profile as the material cures, and also how much is the, um, the material going to shrink. And also, very important is knowing what's the coordination between these uh, events. So at each um, moment in time or each time increment, we need to have, we need to know um, how much did the material shrink, uh, at which stiffness, and if there's a change in temperature, how much did the, the how much was the thermal expansion or contraction? Um, and in this case, we usually start at the the micro scale, so at the the phase level residual stress development. So this means um, what's what's happening for the resin and what's happening for the fiber. And in this case, uh, residual stress develops because we have mismatch between uh, thermal expansion of resin and fiber and also because the resin is, is shrinking um, around the fibers. Um, then we move on um, to the mesoscale, so this is at the, the ply level, residual stress development. So if we have mismatches between layers of a laminate, and this, this is usually the case because usually you don't have a unidirectional laminate, you have plies that have um, different orientations, and then you can also have different materials uh, in one laminate, so this will create mismatch between um, uh, thermal expansion and shrinkage of, of supplies and, and lead to uh, residual stress development. And then moving on to the macro scale, and this is where um, you'll get um, the, uh, the effect of geometric features and constraints in your, in your part. Um, this is where you get thermal gradients um, in different 
between different areas of your component. You can have volume fraction variations if there have been resin flow, so this will create areas of different stiffness in your laminate. Fraction between uh, different components of an assembly, if that's the case. Um, Two-part interaction, as I said before, so this will, if they have different thermal expansions, this will lead to residual stress development at the interface, machining, et cetera. So all these uh, play, play a role into uh, what's going to be the, your final part shape. Um, so moving on now to um, a description of uh, composites processing modeling using Compro. So this is basically um, describing how we use Compro to um, analyze these different areas of, of the process so that we can ultimately at the end come up with the, um, the, the deformations of, of the part. So Compro is basically a um, simulation platform. Um, it supercharges uh, commercially available finite element solvers uh, such as Abacus, ANSYS, or open source ones such as uh, OFEM. Um, and it takes advantage of the latest uh, finite element um, um, features. So um, whatever new modeling techniques, whatever new um, solver um, algorithms that are developed by, by, by commercially available software, uh, Compro is, is very agnostic. It, it sits on the background handling material properties and, and so it, 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 it's always in step with, with the latest developments. Um, if you're using finite element analysis already in your workflow to, to simulate um, manufacturing or to analyze composite materials, um, you can easily integrate Compro in your workflow. Um, and you can use it um, primarily to answer the question if uh, your manufactured structure conform to your engineering specification. And this is not only um, about uh, process-induced deformations and, and dimensional conformance, but also uh, was a thermal profile uh, within spec and, um, and, and also how can we troubleshoot the part moving forward using simulation. So comp composites uh, process modeling using Compro is basically divided um, in three different uh, major areas. So we have the thermal chemical analysis, which is uh, what we use to um, assess the thermal lags, the, the exotherm um, and the thermal gradients within our part. Then we have the full compaction analysis, um, which is used mostly to simulate resin flow um, and compaction of the fiber bed um, in the pre-gelation stage of the, of, the, of the composite. And from that we can, we can analyze what's the, the volume fraction uh, variation in our part. We can assess if there was porosity developed. Um, we can also assess uh, thickness changes due to resin flow um, and also wrinkling. And then finally we have the uh, stress deformation step, um, which is the, the, um, the step where we actually calculate the, the process induced deformation. So this basically uh, calculates residual stress, and then we can put a spring in of curved sections or warpage of, of, of flat, flat parts of our, of our components. So a little bit more uh, detail into each of these. Um, so a thermochemical analysis um, uh, is basically um, a heat transfer analysis that's used not only to calculate um, the thermal evolution of the part, but also the curing, uh, so the chemical reaction of the resin in this case. Um, so we take into account the heat that's generated due to the curing of, of thermal setting resins um, during the thermal cycle. And then based on this, we can um, uh, study the thermal lag so that this is um, what's the difference between the temperature um, surrounding the part or what's the, the, the temperature in your tool and what's the temperature in your part. Uh, we can assess thermal gradients, uh, and also we can assess exotherms. So this is how, um, as the material cures, how, as the resin is is um, is generating heat, and and the part is heating up um, sometimes beyond your, your your temperature. This is assessing how much will the the part heat up, and if we're if we're still within uh, the tolerance of our manufacturing process in terms of maximum temperature. 
Um, then we have flow compaction analysis. So this is um, where we have um, the representation of our laminate um, as a fully saturated fiber bed with, uh, with resin that's uh, able to flow uh, through the part. So this takes into account uh, the evolution of the viscosity of the resin during the cure cycle and also what's the, the permeability of, of the fibers uh, relative to, to the compaction of due to autoclave pressure. Um, and from this we can, we can um, basically uh, study what's the volume fraction distribution. So how, as the resin flows um, from one area of the part to another or, or even bleeds out of the part, um, what's the volume fraction uh, that, that remains in your, in your composite. Um, so you can also study this as the resin flows. It also induces thickness changes in your laminate. Um, and based on um, how the resin flows, you can also track what's the evolution of, of resin pressure um, in your laminate. And then finally, there's the, um, the stress deformation analysis. So this is, um, this is basically the, the static um, stress analysis. Um, in your finite element solver. Um, so this is where we calculate the internal stress development and then um, we calculate um, what's, the final, what's the final shape of the part, the freestanding uh, shape of the part when we remove the tool at the end of the manufacturing process. So this is uh, now where we take into account what's the, the CTE, um, the CTE mismatch between part and tool. Uh, the CT mismatch between resin and fibers, um, the cure shrinkage of the resin, and then also um, the stiffness evolution and, and um, relaxation of the, of the resin during the process. So we can have um, uh, the stiffness representation of the resin as, as uh, what we call child, so it's um, cure hardening instantaneous linear elastic. Uh, representation. Um, we can have pseudo viscoelastic or we can have um, full viscoelasticity, um, which can be especially um, important if if we have uh, post cures or if if we have different holes in our in our cure cycle. So out of this simulation, again, this is where we get uh, the spring in of, of uh, curved sections. We get warpage of flat sections. We get um, a prediction of the residual stresses within our part that can then be um, used to assess if we have if we have uh, reached the, a certain maximum, or we can even propagate it further to to any any uh, uh, later stress analysis of our of our components. Um, so now for each of these um, simulations, there's a certain amount uh, of material properties that are required to to successfully run uh, these cases. So the thermochemical analysis, we really need, um, well, number one and perhaps uh, most important, we need, we need to know the evolution of the degree of cure um, during a manufacturing process. Um, so this is um, what we call the cure kinetics um, of, the, of the resin. Uh, also, usually paired with it, we need to have um, an idea of, of the glass transition temperature as the material cures, and also what's, what's the heat of reaction, so what's the total heat that is, is going to be generated by the resin as it cures. Um, then we need uh, density of both uh, fiber and resin, uh, specific heat capacity for both components, as well as uh, the thermal conductivity. Um, usually in this case for the fiber, uh, for density, specific heat, and conductivity, we usually are quite satisfied with, with data sheet values. Um, and then for the resin, we, we, we provide characterization services at conversion that are able to accurately, accurately capture the, the evolution of all these properties. Then for flow compaction analysis, um, we need to know our starting point uh, of the material, so we need to know our initial um, fiber volume fraction, so this is usually at the, uh, provided by the, by the material manufacturer. And then we need to know um, what's the permeability of our fiber bed um, and what's, what's the compaction behavior of, of our fiber bed. So as we apply more pressure to it, what's, what's going what's gonna to be the, um, the strain-stress relationship, um, which is usually a hardening relationship, how is that 
um, uh, that can um, evolve. And then for the resin, we need to know the, the resin viscosity. So all these um, are also characterized and offered as a service by conversant. And then finally, for the stress and deformation analysis, we need to know um, basically what's the um, what's the um, the viscoelastic constants or the elastic constants of our material. Uh, we need to know then what's the thermal expansion and what's the the cure shrinkage. And then again, uh, for fiber um, properties, uh, we usually go by data sheet values because the fiber uh, doesn't really uh, change as as the manufacturing process goes along. Um, but for the resin, we, we, we also do um, characterize all these properties. Um, then in the context of um, assessing uh, process-induced deformations, um, uh, where we, the, the final step, the stress and deformation step, is the one that gives us uh, that information, um, we usually um, follow an analysis workflow that sequentially couples um, the three uh, analysis steps. So we start by running the thermal chemical problem that gives us uh, the evolution of temperature and degree of cure um, throughout our part. And then we can use that, um, that temperature and degree of cure history to, to run a flow compaction analysis, which will tell us uh, what is the volume fraction distribution if there was any resin flow or if resin bled um, out of our part. Um, so we run that flow compaction case up to gelation of the resin um, and then using that, that gelled uh, fiber volume fraction um, distribution, we use that as our initial um, starting point for stress deformation analysis. Um, so basically the thermal chemical and flow compaction analysis um, are useful to give us the the three fundamental state variables uh, inputs that we need to know exactly the, the material properties, the material state um, throughout the stress and deformation analysis, which is uh, the temperature, uh, the degree of cure, and the fiber volume fraction. Um, so now moving on uh, to um, going over an example of how we would um, apply this, this simulation um, steps in a, in a process-induced deformation uh, workflow. Uh, so this is based on, um, this is done with the help of uh, Dassault Systems um, products. We're, um, in this example, we use CATIA to generate our geometry, generate our preliminary mesh. Um, then we use Composites Link uh, to export um, that mesh, that those layup definitions into Abacus. Um, and then within Abacus, we also use another tool called um, Composites Modeler to help actually generate the mesh and assign the layups to the different sections of our part. And then um, we use Compro to, to facilitate uh, running the analysis and also interpreting the results. Um, then once we have um, our cured uh, our final part, our final deformed shape of our part, we can also export that shape um, and then bring it back into CATIA using the what's called a realistic shape optimizer to then do tooling compensation so that um, we can then uh, run this uh, iteration once again um, and simulate uh, once again with that compensated tool so that we can verify that now we have um, a final component that um, that uh, is within tolerance with with engineering specifications. So I'm presenting a um, a case study that has been uh, published in literature uh, that was done um, at Convergent with the collaboration with Boeing. Um, so this is the case of the um, the Boeing 777 Astra uh, trailing edge fairing. Um, so this is those um, those um, canoe canoe shaped um, structures that that sit uh, under the wing at the trailing edge. Um, they're mostly used for uh, separating the flow between different uh, control surfaces of the wing. And, and in this case, um, experience has shown um, that 
the process-induced deformations of uh, manufacturing this part were, were quite significant. So, so when, when they try to manufacture the, um, this part with a tool with the same um, shape as the engineering specifications, you get quite a lot of process-induced deformations. Um, so in our analysis workflow, the first step um, is to basically have our part configuration and also our process configuration. Uh, so in this case, um, we have what's basically a honeycomb structure with um, a honeycomb core and then two composite carbon skins um, that um, then merge uh, with one another at the, uh, at the edges of the part. So we have different layup zones in our part. We have uh, also an adhesive uh, between the core and the skins in, the, in the, the areas of the part that have the sandwich core. And then uh, this part is about uh, 1.8 meters long and, and um, 30 centimeters wide. And we're using, uh, we're processing this, this part in a, in a female tool as we see in the picture. So with the help of CATIA, uh, we can create um, the geometry of both part and tool. So in this case, uh, what we're doing is we are creating um, a solid tool, but, um, but assigning just a surface for the part. Um, and then we're defining layup zones within that surface um, that can be then exported to Abacus for, for generating the, the proper solid mesh. Um, so in this case, uh, we're meshing the part um, with approximately 8,000 um, quad elements, um, and we're meshing the tool with, with solid um, tetrahedral elements. So it's, the tooling is um, isotropic material, so we don't, we don't quite need to have um, a, very, a very structured mesh in this case. So uh, tetrahedral elements are, are quite adequate. Um, then we export uh, both part and tool um, out of CATIA to be imported into Abacus. So the part uh, we export through um, a quite, a, quite a useful tool in CATIA, it's called Composites Link. So this let, lets us export both the mesh and also the layup definitions for, for, for the part. Um, then as we import into, into Abacus, uh, now we extrude that surface mesh that we created for the part um, using composites model for Abacus. Um, we do this because it's a, it's a very time-saving tool that um, allows us to create, um, as you can see here in the picture, allows us to create here these transitions in the mesh between uh, the sandwich uh, section and the, the carbon fiber only sections. Um, by specifying different thicknesses to the elements, and also it automatically assigns um, the layup zones um, to the different solid elements in our section. So in this case, we have uh, four solid uh, elements, so each one of these uh, elements will have its own section, its own, um, its own layup, so Composites Modeler takes a lot of the work out of that process, which could be uh, quite cumbersome. Um, then within Abacus, we, we also have to define the rest of our uh, finite element model. This includes appropriate initial and boundary conditions, uh, loads, so in this case pressure, uh, temperature, um, contact between part and tool. So all those things need to be, um, need to be uh, defined as in, as in any other uh, finite element model. Um, but then running the model um, is run through uh, Compro plugin within Abacus CCA, which, which is um, quite a helpful tool for, um, for, for going through the steps of, of creating the model and analyzing the results afterwards. Um, so within Abacus, the Compro plugin, um, as you can see in the pictures, uh, you can access it if you um, at the top menu, if you scroll down the plugins list, and you'll see Compro, um, and then it will pop up the, the Compro plugin window. Uh, so this provides an interface for doing some of the pre-processing steps, uh, submitting your jobs, and also uh, doing some post-processing in your simulation. Um, you can also use it to export um, 
one D one dimensional um, drill through um, sections into Raven to do thermal analysis. So you can, based on your, if you have a, a complex geometry, for example, and you're trying to you're trying to assess exactly, uh, for example, if you have a, a workflow that has uh, flow compaction and you want to run it to gelation, and then from gelation onwards you want to move on to the to the stress deformation step, you can quickly export um, a 1D drill through through part and tool, run it in Raven, and then quickly see the evolution of of the resin viscosity and, and find out exactly when gelation happens so you can you can time um, you can time between one step and the other. Um, so there's different tabs uh, within the the Compro plugin. So the first tab is the materials tab. So this allows you to access um, your materials library, your CCA materials library, um, where you can quickly add or remove materials from your model. Um, so you can add your the composites materials that you have, um, neat resins or adhesives, uh, tooling or other materials that may be available. Um, so this this uh, library will include all the materials that are that are shipped out um, with Compro, but also you could using Raven as as um, has been. Um, Presented in, in in previous workshops, you can you can um, create your own materials and um, and then add them to this library as you go. And then the second tab lets you define lets you add to the simulation um, each of the three steps. So you can add whatever step um, you want to simulate, or you can add them all um, at once and create and create a model that will go through all those all those um, analysis set steps. Um, then you'll have uh, the analysis tab, and this is basically where you have um, where you select uh, what kind of analysis are you going uh, to perform. So you can run analysis individually, where um, um, you you will use uh, predefined state variable fields. So in this case, for example, if you're running a full compaction analysis uh, individually and you don't have a thermochemical analysis, you can Prescribe a temperature cycle to your model, and and that will that will serve as your um, as your definition of temperature, and also um, the as the flow compaction analysis um, progresses, it will also calculate the degree of cure based on on temperature, and and be able to populate um, uh, that state variable. Or alternatively, you can use the, the this plugin tab to to run um, the simulation sequentially, so you can you can just say, um, yeah, run thermochemical analysis followed by running the flow compaction analysis, and then finally running the stress deformation analysis. Um, and the plugin will just um, run them sequentially as as I've presented before. Or alternatively, you can also, if you already ran a thermochemical analysis previously, you can just uh, point um, the plugin to the results file, and that will be incorporated as the as your as your time and temperature um, and degree of cure histories for for flow compaction or for stress deformation that you're trying to run. Um, so once you've um, selected the the appropriate options for for running your analysis, then you can use um, this tab also for checking um, the model unit, so you, you need to either specify that using um, uh, SI or, or Imperial units, um, and then you can either um, submit the jobs locally or you can write uh, the input files to then uh, maybe submit um, in a different machine or, or run through a command line. Um, now, if you submit your jobs locally, this these will appear um, on the jobs tab, and you can follow the progress. So it will give you a, um, a status indication of if it's if it's running, if it's waiting, if it's running. What's the percentage of of the simulation that has been um, completed? And then once once um, once the job is done, you can go to the post processing tab, where you'll be able to uh, perform two. Two different tasks. So one, you'll be able to create a plot that will give you um, the temperature envelope and the degree of cure envelope uh, of your simulation. Um, so this is quite important for um, thermal assessment 
of your of your manufacturing process, and then um, for the for the the form shape of your part, um, you'll also have the option of being able to export um, this the form shape to a point cloud that can then be imported back into CATIA for for tool compensation. Um, so when we performed the thermochemical analysis on that um, on that canoe fairing um, on that canoe fairing part for the Boeing triple seven, um, we can plot at the end um, the temperature and degree of cure envelopes. And in this case, we can see um, that the the top the top surface of the part um, heat up quite. Um, a lot quicker than, than the bottom of, of the part, and we'll see um, a thermal lag, a thermal gradient between these two surfaces, which will also be translated into a, a degree of cure um, gradient between top and bottom. And so, uh, depending on your specification, this can help you troubleshoot um, thermal problems. This can, you can use it to um, analyze um, if you're if you have um, a process that that corresponds to 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 the what's set out in the in the, in the specifications, and then based on this, you could also um, look into um, doing either tool changes or or process changes that will uh, try to bring these gradients uh, closer together. If that's the case, um, then. Following the thermochemical step, now in this case we uh, we skip the full compaction step. Um, we can we can um, go straight to the stress deformation analysis, and so following following that analysis, we can plot uh, the freestanding the form shape of of this fairing. Uh, in this case, it's quite uh, exaggerated, it's five times the deformation. But we can see that, especially in that in that um, in those um, in that edge on the left side, you can see that there's quite a quite a difference between uh, our original tool shape and our our final um, our final final deformed shape. And if you can see, like the the maximum um, the maximum magnitude of displacement in our part, um, we're actually four millimeters um, four millimeters off of of our initial shape. Um, so in this case, a comparison has also been made uh, with six fairings that were um, manufactured and then measured uh, with that original um, tool surface, and we can see that uh, our model has a, a very good prediction of, of the, the deformation throughout, the, um, basically throughout the length of our part if we follow this um, the top edge. So we start at just just around four millimeters. And then we start um, decaying all the way to to zero, right at the at the symmetry plane of our part. Um, so now that we've um, we've um, we've created our deformed shape, uh, we've predicted the outcome of our manufacturing process, uh, and then once we export um, the point cloud from from the Compro plugin, we can bring it back to CATIA again using the realistic shape optimizer. And so we do this by mapping uh, depth to form point cloud to our tool surface. So you can see that on the left. And then based on that, we can morph that tool surface based on this, the, um, this deformation um, point cloud. So we can see um, on your right, so we have in, in gray, you have your original tool surface. Um, in blue, you have the calculated part deformation, so it springs in um, as a result of your manufacturing process. Um, but what we what we can do to compensate the tool now is that we can we can basically take the negative of that deformation, apply it to the tool, and you can have the the end result will be that green surface um, that will hopefully. Um, bring you bring your your part at the end of manufacturing to that original tool shape, to that shape that you actually want to manufacture. Um, so going back to our um, design design flow for um, um, compensating process-induced deformations, um, you can 
then with that deform tool shape, you can go back into Katia, regenerate your mesh, uh, import it back into Abacus, run through the Compro simulations, and see if you actually have the, um, the required uh, part shape. Sometimes it's um, it's not a one step um, one step process. Sometimes you need one or two iterations to actually get uh, the desired part shape because it's um, it's a very um, interdependent process. Uh, but um, that that that's um, a tried and true workflow for for compensating your your process induced deformation. Um, so in terms of workflow tools that are required to to run this, um, you have minimum requirements. So at at the very least, um, you'll need uh, Abacus or um, a different finite element solver. If you could use uh, Ansys instead, uh, but you need a finite element solver, and then you need Compro um, to be able to to actually um, calculate the evolution of material properties during the cure cycle. Um, then we also recommend, we strongly recommend having some sort of um, um, add-on to, to create the composites within, within Abacus. So uh, for Abacus, this is the composites modeler, and this, this takes a lot, of, a lot of the complexity out of um, creating the different layups for different elements and then actually assigning them um, to your finite element mesh. And then from then on, you can there's there's different tools that you can have, uh, mostly within Katia to to automate um, generating meshes within Katia, um, assigning layups, um, and then doing the the tool compensation with the, the realistic shape optimizer. Um, so this was it uh, for today. I hope um, I hope this was um, useful information. So I'll now. Um, Pass it along to Alistair for, yeah, for any questions you. that might be yeah, coming our way. Thank you, Paolo. That, that was great. Uh, so, if anybody has questions, we have we're just a little bit a uh, little bit of time left here. Um, so, if anybody does have questions, please type them into the host right now. Um, there was a few specific ones that we'll follow up um, after the fact um, with, and so one that had come up. That I think was was you touched on just at the end here was about different types of solvers that can be used. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so I think in this um, in this particular case we presented the the workflow within Abacus and the SO Systems tools. Of course, there are other workflows within sort of the Ansys um, um, family of products there, uh, and then there are some open uh, open source ones like OFEM that are are coming on board with workflows uh, very similar as well. Uh, so it's, you're not entirely locked in, but this is a workflow that we showed here as well. Um, and one other one that came up was about whether or not you need to do all of those simulations, right? The sort of right. chemical flow compaction. Right. And yeah. so you can just touch on where, when yeah. you might skip over one or Yeah, so I'll go back to slide number. Yeah, so, um, so you don't, you, this is the, the most complex scenario. So this is where, um, if you have a complex part with uh, lots of different layups, lots of different thicknesses, you'll have um, different areas of your part curing at different times, and then you also have bleed. You can, you have um, very complex curvature that will will result in in resin flow during your part. So in that in that case where you have a complex part. Then it's advisable to run these these three cases. So, for example, in the canoe fairing example that I just presented, um, the curing timing at the top and bottom of the of our component was um, was quite different. So, um, so in that case, it 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 uh, it is helpful to to have a thermochemical simulation um, to be able to capture that difference in temperature evolution and degree of cure evolution between. Uh, top and bottom. Right, and I guess that's caused by the um, honeycomb core that was in there, right? So that's yeah, really so the honeycomb core, if you have a tool that has a lot of thermal mass that will take a lot of time to heat up, then you'll have um, different, um, um, different, different heating profiles. Um, but if you have a part that's um, less complex, um, if you have a component that, that is not, doesn't have very different uh, sections, 
in your laminate. Um, so you can, you, if you can assume a certain uniform temperature distribution, or even if you have um, thermocouple data on your part, if you have um, different thermocouples spread out through your part, and you can see that it's mostly uniform, or even if they're not, if you can incorporate that data into your model, then you can you can skip these steps and just use them as as uh, basically in, predefined inputs for your for your state for your stress deformation analysis. So in this case, you could you could skip and do just the, the final one, provided that you have a good description of the others. Great. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we'll cut it off there. We'll respond. There's one or two, uh, two more specific questions we'll respond to um, directly. Uh, then, so the next webinar that we're planning is actually uh, the end of March, March 26th, and it's going to be uh, back to Raven and how to add new materials into Raven. Um, so I hope everybody will be able to join us then, um, and thank you very much for joining us today.